enjoy it. If I go, it's fine. I, somebody else enjoys it. But I will not be uh, in a hurry to begin to do all of the things that some people were doing. Thank you for coming. Um, we're hoping that um, we'll be freer next time. Usually, like we started, we'll take time to greet ourselves, but some people are not comfortable um, shaking and all of that, so that's fine. But um, those who are around you, please just um, wink your eye. At least that can be a smile to them. of your word gives light, gives light, gives hope, gives all that we need. We thank you for the power of your word that is sharper than any two-edged sword and it divides to the marrow and the bone, oh Lord. And we pray that today we would enjoy the blessings from your word. Your word has told us that it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, that we'll all be strengthened to righteousness. May that be so for us this morning again, that your name will be glorified. By the power of your Holy Spirit, eternal Father, interpret your words to all of us that we would leave here desirous to do that which you have taught us, being grateful that we came into your presence this morning. Do that which we cannot do, Heavenly Father, as we lift up your name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. If you've been around our church, you know that for every year, when a book is given or the theme for the year is given, we try to go through the book that it comes from. I wish I could was not giving revelation. I tell you truthfully, I wish it was not revelation. But it's good. It's good because um, going around the church, you would find out that many of us have been cherry picking in the book of Revelation. When I mean by cherry picking, we just pick aspects that are not very difficult and just read those ones and we leave the rest. So not many of us have gone through the book of Revelation. So fasten your seatbelt, get ready. It's going to be a very interesting ride, but it will get bumpy along the way because Revelation is a very difficult book to interpret. In fact, if you do languages, if anybody, if you have the opportunity of doing languages, you know that Revelation has one of the most difficult of all the, lang of all the books. It's one of the most difficult to interpret even in the original language. And it's also difficult to uh, interpret even in English. Because John is talking of things that are beyond his own comprehension, things that only God uh, could see. But our theme this year is in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7, look. He is coming with the clouds. And that's what we want to talk about. Look, he is coming. And so this morning, we'll be in Revelation chapter 1. I will read verse 1 to verse 8. And we'll take this book, with more of the themes around the book. We might not be able to do it verse by verse because of the length of the book. But I believe that we'll be able to go through the book. First of all, Revelation chapter number 1 and verse 1. The Bible says, the revelation from Jesus Christ which God gave to him to show his servants that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him, who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful, faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. And has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look. He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Amen. Just reading this, you will know that sometimes there's a lot of, there are a lot of things that are said in the book of Revelation that are not open to us. When I mean open to us, they, we have not experienced them. And when you approach the book of Revelation, there are 
ways of interpreting it, but one thing is sure from what we see in the introduction and how the book is introduced to us, that the first thing that we're going to see in the book of Revelation is the unveiling of Jesus Christ. The unveiling of Jesus Christ, which God showed to his servant and which will soon take place. One of the things you must know is that when the Bible talks about something happening soon, it is not the timing of man, but the timing of God. And so because of that, there have been many postulations as to who some of these things talked about. Some people believe that it was the happenings that was happening around Jerusalem at the time when there was a very wicked king called Nero. Nero was so wicked that history says, or one of the things that he says about Nero's wickedness, that they thought Nero was actually the Antichrist. Nero was wicked to the degree that he was burning Christians on the stakes and using them as light in his garden to eat when he's uh, entertaining his friends. That's how bad he was to Christians. And because of how he persecuted Christians, he did it so badly that not for anything, he just has dinner with his friends, brings his friends around, sits in his garden, hangs the Christians on sticks around the garden, burns them, and as they are burning, they form the light for the dinner. That's how bad Nero was. Nero was so wicked, so they thought Nero was the Antichrist. But time has gone, and Hitler came, and they thought he was the Antichrist. In fact, some people have alluded to Bill Clinton. They've alluded to Barack Obama. In fact, if they play around your name, you can become the Antichrist if you interpret it wrongly. But as we look at this book, we would see that historically there are things that happened in this book. And then prophetically there are things that were said about the things that were going to happen. But the fundamental thing we must realize is that the book talks about the person of Jesus Christ. And the greatness of Jesus Christ is seen in this book. It also tells us the one who received the message. So it says that it is made known by an angel to John. John. It's interesting how John arrives on the island of Patmos. That John arrives on the island of Patmos by God's design. And a lesson for each and every one of us. Christians were being persecuted. Um, the apostles were being killed. History says John, who saw this revelation, is one of the only apostles, if not the only one, who was not martyred but died a natural death. Because John was supposed to be killed. And when the king then of the Roman world, who taught himself to be a god, and because they taught themselves to be gods, people had to worship them. But John refused to worship him. And so John was placed in hot oil. I hope you've read that history. And please never forget it because he has lessons for each and every one of us. But John was placed in hot boiling oil. Not just that the oil was boiled and kept, but it was boiling while John was placed in the oil. And as John was placed in the oil, history says John sat in oil as if he was sitting down under a place that had air conditioning. He sat down and moved. He sat down and touched. Not was wrong and the king who thought he was a god saw this great miracle and said this man must be a god and there cannot be two gods in this kingdom so I ban you to the island of Patmos John arrived the island of Patmos and the book of Revelation was given I say that to encourage some of us that sometimes when people come against you God may be preparing to move you from somewhere because of the circumstances to a place where he wants to show himself in a different and more spectacular way sometimes we fight those things we are angry because the situation is not good. The circumstances are bad. If John fought his persecution, he will never have been in the island of Patmos. If he was never in the island of Patmos, you and I would not have the privilege of reading the book of Revelation today. And so when we walk with God, God sometimes leads us to ways and places that we don't plan, we don't want, but in the circumstances, he proves himself to be almighty because at the end of everything, it is for his glory, everything he's done. So John is the one going to take this revelation. John is going to be spoken to by an angel. The angel was going to, re to, to, to reveal to John and to testify everything. So John is saying, I'm going to tell you what I saw. I'm going to tell you about the testimony of Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you about the things that are in the word of God. Because if you look at the book of Revelation, there are references to other books in the scripture. So it is the word of God being fulfilled. But I'm going to tell you things that none of you have seen that Christ is going to reveal to me. Then it says in verse 3, a blessing that all of us should take note of. And I want us to all go and look at verse 3 now. It says this, and if we can put it on the screen, I'll be happy so that we all can read it because this is where we all come in, in the first instance of this book. Let's read it together. If you may, it's up on the screen. Let's go. Three, go. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. 
So first of all, is that you need to read the word of God. In this text, it says, blessed are those who take heed to this prophecy, who take heed to the things that are written in this book. So first of all, it is that John is referencing the book of Revelation and the things that he's going to say as God reveals them to him. But it also covers the whole book of the Bible. So what he's saying is that uh, uh, in his context is the book of Revelation. But in the totality of scripture is the whole Bible. First thing is that blessed are those who read these words. By read aloud in the old time, they took these books and they read in the congregation of God's people because they didn't have Bibles like we have. We all are carrying one form of Bible or the other. Hard copy, soft copy, different translations. They didn't have all of that. They only had one scroll that was written and then somebody came and read it to all of them. So reading the scripture aloud was part of what they did. But for us, we may not read like they, read that, like they used to read, but do you read at all? And yesterday we were challenging ourselves and I remind you to give yourself a Bible reading challenge for this year. Give yourself a Bible reading challenge. I'm going to read this number of books this year. I'm going to read this, uh, 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 this, this length of, 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 of Bible this year. Give yourself a Bible reading challenge. Take a book of the Bible and decide that you go, to, you go through them. I encourage you, in as much as I want you to read all of it, if it's the first time you are starting, please start in the New Testament. Look for smaller books. Don't go to the Old Testament. You will go with zeal, I assure you. You will enjoy Genesis. You will enjoy Exodus. When you start hitting Leviticus and Numbers, your zeal begins to drop. Is that not so? By the time you hit Deuteronomy, you begin to become weak. And by that time, you've lost hope. But there are many other things. So to get you excited and into reading it, Take a book in the New Testament. Take a small book, Philemon, small book. One sitting, you can read the whole of that book. Take Titus, take, take, take Timothy, little books, Ephesians, Colossians, four chapter books, five chapter books. But if you want to stretch at the beginning, I give you a very popular one that I tell you every day. Take the book of Proverbs. Start in one chapter, one chapter every day. You read the whole book of Proverbs in one month. But, blessed are those who read this word of prophecy. Blessed are those who hear the words. So just hearing, being around church, being around places where the word of God is read, there's a blessing that comes because except something extraordinary happens. You cannot be in the gathering of God's people, God's word is read, and God doesn't speak to you. Except, when I mean extraordinary, it has to be a problem that is beyond human comprehension. But if you're in the presence of God and your mind is in that place, there's no way the word of God will be read or the message will be preached that God will not give you something to think about. That God will not impress in your heart. So there's blessing reading it, you would learn. There's blessing hearing the word of God. So you should desire to be around places where you hear the word of God. You should desire to be around places where the word of God is going to be read. And that's why we are will always say, as a denomination, one of the things they tell you, that the worship service, the central theme and reason why a worship service holds in an Equa church is the preaching of the gospel. Every other thing is secondary. We can debate on it. Sadly, I say, we have now moved to the point where singing groups become more important than the preaching of the word of God. Why do I say so? They take all the time and give the pastor a few minutes, and by the time the pastor comes, everybody is angry, everybody is tired, Everybody wants to go, so he sees from your faces that you're not happy. And then the more we do that, we pressure the preaching of the gospel and time is reduced. Brothers and sisters, may we go back to our original design that as a denomination, the central reason why we gather is to hear the reading and preaching of the word of God. Not to tell stories, not to make ourselves happy, but to hear the reading and the teaching of the word of God. Because if we do that, then we will help ourselves. Don't come with the excuse that, well, the word of God is in the songs. No. By the time we are singing, some of us are carried away with the melody and we miss the words. And don't come telling me that this group must sing. No group must sing in any aqua church apart from the choir. The rest of you are extras. I say it with confidence. When I get to a church where the women fellowship has become an institution, I know how we say it differently so I don't have problem. Because I assure you, some of you who are following us online know that in some equa churches, the women fellowship is an institution. If they don't sing, the church can go down. That's not why we gather. 
not to hear how wonderful your voices are, whether you are band, women, fellowship, whatever group you are, we gather that the word of God is preached and taught. And then the last challenge is for those who teach and preach, like me. The pulpit is not a place for joking. It's a place for serious business and teaching the word of God. Sadly, there are churches where we go, even in our denomination, I'm not bothered about others, where the word of God is not taken seriously. It's more of a joke and fun fair and making people happy. No, let me tell you from the beginning of the year like I always do, forgive me in advance. This word will come hard on some of us. Don't be angry at me. As long as it's in scripture, you can have a fight with God. Don't fight me because I'm struggling with my own too. This word will come hard sometimes. It's for doctrine. It's for reproof. It's for correction. And sometimes this word will come hard. May we never shy away from telling the truth that the scripture says. Amen? Especially when we have politicians and big men in our churches. May we never shy away from telling them the truth. So there's a blessing from reading. There's a blessing from hearing. But then there is also the blessing that when you hear it, you take it to heart. That it transforms your life. That it transforms your life. The Bible says that you should not be hearers of the word, but be doers also of the word. It is to, to do that shows that we know. So that gives us the basis of what we are going to be meeting. And so it's necessary that we know this. And then John begins to greet the people, identifies himself, and puts his name there as John. And tells us the people that he's writing to. He says the seven churches, but that does not mean it's only for the seven churches. Excuse me. That does not mean that it's only for the seven churches he's writing in the province of Asia. He writes to all Christians, but now specifically he writes to the seven churches, but the lessons are for all the churches, including this church. Every church learns from the book of Revelation that our Lord is soon going to come. Our Lord is going to be revealed for our understanding and for us to walk with him. And he says to them, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits before his throne. He says, the one who we are, who is, who we are going to be talking about is this great God. And grace represents the believer's standing in unmerited favor or kindness before God. That we have his grace lavished on us. We have his grace given to us. And it is from him that we are going to be listening to the things that we are going to uh, uh, listen to. He says grace to us. He says peace to us. The wholeness, the well-being that we have when we have a relationship with God. Not the peace that the world gives, but the peace that God gives. I hope you know the difference. This world has no peace to give to you in reality. The United Nations is struggling, but till this day, and may I say, till the world ends, the United Nations will never be able to bring peace to planet Earth. Peace comes from within and a relationship with Jesus Christ. It is peace with God that helps us live our lives in loving, caring, and, uh, and understanding ways. Wherever human beings are involved, there will always be the place to negotiate. God gives us what we need, how we need it, so that our lives will glorify him. The peace that he gives to us is the peace that comes from Jesus Christ. So the blessing he begins to speak about, about the one who is coming, he tells us grace and peace to us. And then tells us something. That the one who gives us grace and peace is the source of all things. is the beginning of all things. He is the present. He is the past. He is the future. The text tells us that it is from him who is present, who was past, and who is to come future. So he who is present with us, always with us, abiding with us, there for us. He is the one who was in our past, brought us out of where we came from, helped some of us to be what we are now, changed our lives in the past. He's the same God of the future who will lead us and guide us in the days to come. He is the one who has promised us grace and peace. Now, I pray, I pray that you enjoy this grace and peace. Because the one who has promised, as we will see even as we go on, is the one who has always been there. There's nothing that happens that takes him by surprise. There's nothing that will happen that takes him by surprise. Enjoy the grace and the peace that he gives to you. 
So that's why the Bible says, in this world, you will have many troubles, many trials. But what does it say? Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I'm sure some of us are sitting down here, and maybe in your life you are wondering, it's like there's a part of your problem that God has not overcome. If he says he has overcome the world, he has overcome the world. The manifestation of his overcoming is going to come. It may not be now. Some of us are sick. God is a great healer. He has overcome illness, so he's going to provide healing. Some of us are praying for one thing or the other, looking for something that we are trusting him for. God is a great promise keeper, and he's going to keep that promise. Because the one who gives grace and peace is the one who our confidence is in. Grace and peace, and then he brings and introduces the person of the Holy Spirit. Grace and peace to you from him who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne. Welcome to Revelation. Who are the seven spirits? Welcome to the complexities of the book of Revelation. So the discussion starts, who are the seven spirits? Some people believe that it talks about the seven different manifestations and ways that the Holy Spirit can carry out his assignment in our lives. Some people believe that it talks of seven high-ranking angels who are the ones that are said to be the seven spirits. And so when you get to read about the seven churches, it talks about to the, to the angel of this church. So some people believe that it is so. One thing we are sure is that it makes reference to the person of the Holy Spirit. And as it makes reference to the person of the Holy Spirit, if it is manifestations or it is in the person of the, of the Holy Spirit, in the angels that are there, what we get is that this spirit also brings grace and peace. This spirit brings grace and peace. And let me give you something to remember. When it comes to scripture, not everything has been revealed to us. So we can debate from now till thy kingdom come and still be far from truth because not everything has been revealed to us. That which has been revealed to us should be the one that should concern us. So this is a simple thing. The great home, I call him homegrown, homespun philosopher. His name is Mark Twain. If you've ever read anything about Mark Twain, he's more like a homespun. When I mean homespun, he's not known as a person who went to any school of philosophy, but he was able to develop himself. He's the one who says about this, about the Bible. He says, the things that have not been revealed to me are not the things that trouble me in the Bible. It's the things that have been revealed to me that are my trouble. Unfortunately, some of us have left the things that have been revealed to us. Hey, love your neighbor as yourself. Does that need too much interpretation? Do we do it? But some of us want to struggle. When Jesus is coming, will everybody see him at the same time? How will it happen that all will see him at the same time? Is he going to come on a horse or on a donkey? How will the trumpet be? Is it the kind of trumpet? Brother, sister, leave that one for God. Do your own. Bless those who curse you. Do you need interpretation for that? But do we do it? Instead, when they curse you, you are like, my, you know, you want to revenge. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Do we do it? Let me tell you what we do. My friend told me, he says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. <laughs> you like that one, right? <laughs> Let me say it again. He says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. <laughs> That's the one we like. We like that kind of interpretation. Brothers and sisters, the point I'm trying to make is that some of those arguments don't take us anywhere. The person of the Holy Spirit is what is most important, that he supplies to all of us grace and peace. Enjoy that grace. Enjoy that peace. And then he tells us that this blessing comes in verse 2. It comes from Christ because he tells us, and from Christ Jesus in verse 5, that this blessing comes from the throne of grace, the, the spirit who is there, and then it comes from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So Jesus Christ also is the one who gives us grace and peace. Note what has just happened in this passage that we've read, that the grace and peace we talked about comes from the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Nothing lacking, nothing missing. It is for you to enjoy, and I pray that in 2022, you would enjoy God's grace and enjoy God's peace in Jesus' name. That his peace that transcends all understanding will be made manifest to you. That his peace that gives real peace in a chaotic world 
will be available for you. That in the storms of life, people will see you different and ask, what's the difference? And you will be able to tell them, it's not my power. It is his peace that he has given to me. In Jesus' name, amen. But he tells us who Jesus is. Jesus is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So he reveals to us the person of Jesus Christ and tells us a couple of things about him. That first of all, Jesus is the faithful witness of God Almighty. That everything we see and read about Jesus is a clear, faithful representation of who God Almighty is. He tells us that Jesus is the first born from the dead. We saw this in the book of Colossians. That he's the first born from the dead does not mean he's the first to, came, to come back from the dead. But that he's the first to come back from the dead and never to die again. He's the first to come from the dead and never to die again. And because he did it, we all are now beneficiaries of that that has happened. It tells us that he's the ruler of the kings of the earth. That reminds me that there's no king in place that is above the king of kings. No king. No king. No ruler. You make yourself a dictator, it's just a matter of time. The owner of life will call you home. You make yourself too strong in an office, it's just a matter of time. If they don't sack you, you will retire. If you don't retire, you will resign because you'll get tired one day. You would go. But there's a king that never leaves. He doesn't transfer. He doesn't retire. He doesn't get old. He doesn't have a retirement age because he lives in all of eternity. He is forever and ever the ruler of all rulers. That's why he's called king of kings. He's called lord of lords because every lord can have subjects, but he's the only one who is not subject to anyone. He is God all by himself. And this is the good news. He is your king. He is your Lord. Live in that joy. Live in the victory that no king can intimidate you because no king is stronger than your king. Live in the victory that no king can molest you because your king is the king of kings. Live in the joy and satisfaction that because of who he is to you, no one in any office, in any school, in any business, should get up, point his finger at you and intimidate you and you go back afraid. The best you can do is to keep calm. Go to your closet and tell your father, Father, he thinks he's greater than you. Please fight my battle and walk out to the office and see what God can do. But sadly, we're afraid. Sadly, we're afraid. Because some people have more money than us. We're afraid. We shake and tremble before them. Because they have power. Because they, can, they are the ones in charge of our promotion. Hey, nobody's in charge of anything about your life if God does not allow it to happen. He gives express permission. And when it's time, anybody can think they have that power. If God needs to move some people out, he will move them out so that he can do what he wants to do with you. Have that confidence because this king is your king. And this is the king that we're going to be unveiling as we go on. Then he tells us of the redemption he gives to us. Look at verse 6, 5b if you may. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. And so when he says that what he's going to be revealing are things that have already been written in the word in verse 2. You see here the reference to the fact that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. We see here the fact that it is the blood of Jesus Christ that has washed our sins away. And because our sins have been washed away, we have redemption and freedom. Note what he says, that he has freed us from our sins. Child of God, you've been freed from your sin. And so the popular saying that when Satan tries to remind you of your sin, remind him of his future. Because Revelation will tell us what will happen to him. He has freed us from our sins. He has made us to be two things, a kingdom and priest. And the priests that he has made us to become are priests to serve God. Now note what he says, to serve God and his father. So Jesus is now being re he's referencing God as, our, as his father. He's referencing God like we see in other books of the Bible where he tells us that he and the father are one but makes us understand that the father remains the father, remains God Almighty. He is the son. We have been made to become a kingdom. We have been made to become a special people. The apostle Peter says that we are a royal priesthood, a peculiar nation, God's holy people. And so God has made us a kingdom and a kingdom of priests. Let me ask you. In 2021, as a priest in the kingdom, how was your service to the king? How was your service to 
the Father. In 2022, what's your plan for better service to the Father? You've been saved, we say, to serve. Revelation tells us that he has made us to become a kingdom and priest to serve. Underscore that, to serve his God and Father. How much are you serving God? How much are you serving God? When we talk about serving God, we're not even talking about full-time ministry. In the places where you walk, in the places where you school, in your home, when God is glorified, when you walk in obedience to him and do the things that honor him, you are giving yourself to service to God. But when you are driven by yourself alone and thinking of yourself and your comfort, you are not giving yourself to service to God. So how much of service are you giving to God? And how much of service do you plan to give to God? And he says, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Glory and power. This king and this Lord that have been introduced to us, we read in verse 7, he's coming with the clouds. Amen. He's coming with the clouds. And every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and all peoples will see him. And they would mourn because of him. And he says, so shall it be and ends with an amen. Jesus is coming. Some people have laughed at it, but Jesus is coming. Christ has, gone, has not gone to heaven to stay there, but to prepare a place for us. And so he has sent his spirit to dwell in us to prepare us for that place. And he left physically, he's going to return physically. When my father used to preach that Jesus is coming and read this passage, every eye will see him. They preached it by faith. Huh. They preached it by faith. Today, every eye will see him. You'll see him on your handset. Because some people will see him coming and snap. Every eye will see him. <laughs> oh, yes. If people can see fellow human beings drowning and dying and not save them and snap, first they are concerned about the pictures they will send. Then when they see a glorious arrival, what do you think they will do? They will snap. They will take pictures. And in fact, thank you for reminding me. You know, you can take just the pictures. Some people will do it the other way. They will, I know some, some of them are here. God will only help them that day. If he's coming and he's on this screen, they will position themselves so that they will be in the picture as a selfie with the arrival, you know. They know themselves. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> they will take selfie with the great arrival so that you say, I will look, 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 look. In fact, we've gotten to the point where some people can take the picture and crop themselves into it. But all eyes will see him. And let me remind you, they will see him at very lightning speed. For those of you who are following some of the teachings, let me maybe bust your bubble. In this town, in Abuja, 5G has been launched. If you don't know, know it now. At least I'm sure of two networks that have done test run on their 5G. The speed is astronomical. The speed is beyond imagination. And if Jesus doesn't come, I'm sure we'll reach 7G before we leave this world. So for those of you thinking, if we take the, va if we take the vaccine, we are 5G compliant, it is already there. It has nothing to do with whether you take the vaccine or don't take the vaccine. If you are in doubt, your country, in your country, they've given approval for the launching, and it has been done, of 5G. I'm not saying because of the vaccine. I'm saying to remind you, all eyes will see him. When God said this thing, there were no networks like this today. But because he's a God who is in the future, he knew that a day like this will come. That we all can see. In fact, you will see too many. Some of you, thank God for WhatsApp. Do you get messages that show forwarded many times? I leave the rest for you to think what will happen. <laughs> Jesus is coming. Everybody will see him. Those who pierced him. Those who mocked at him. Those who laughed at him. Yes, some of them may not be alive. Some of us will say. But we all know that there are some who mock 
our belief in the return of Jesus Christ is just a matter of time. If God has been faithful to give us salvation, if God has been faithful to fulfill every promise of his word, if God has been faithful to keep the promises of his word, the coming of Jesus Christ, he's going to make it come to pass. That's our belief because in the time of reading this word, all his promises are yea and amen. And all of you sitting down here can testify that his promises have come to pass over your life. If he has been faithful in keeping that, he will be faithful in coming to take us home. Jesus is coming. But are you ready for his coming? Jesus is coming. And so the Bible tells us that he's going to come. And so he says, look, behold, see. He announces again the central theme of this book, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the coming, the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming and he will come to take each and every one to that place of eternal rest. The Lord is coming. Are you ready for his coming? Some of us are going to see him. I used to laugh at my dad. My dad was so zealous for God. Zealous, I mean zeal. Some of you have heard, but let me tell you, for those of you that are not, he's, he was so zealous that when he got married, after he was joined with his wife, and then they called for the speaker, the guy left his wife and preached in his wedding. Yeah. Have you had that before? No, that's the kind of father I have. That's how zealous my father. He left his new wife and preached on his wedding day. So what do you say at that kind of... <laughs> so growing up, my dad would not buy any property. He didn't want anything. And when he has, he said, he's going to heaven. So sometimes I call him. I say, you've not gone. You are not enjoying grandchildren. Go now. He's always happy when he sees grandchildren. He's here. How are they? He will call and find us. Ah, Baba, you're still around. God's timing is different from our timing. Some of us, the trump of God will sound and we will go. Some of us have gone ahead. But are you ready? Enjoy all that is available. Invest that you, as much as you can invest. But don't put your mind and heart in this earthly investment. The king is coming. We are going someday. Enjoy all that you have. Get all that you have. Get all the education you can get. Pursue the desires of your heart that do not contravene the things of God. But remember, the king is coming someday. The king is coming someday. And he closes this section that we have read with these words. Talking about the everlasting one. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The king is coming. And when the king is coming, in this second coming, that the king is coming. He's coming and he is the one who is the beginning and the end. We've heard this before. Alpha is the first um, alphabet. In Greek, omega is the last. And so what he's saying is that he's all of it from beginning to end. That second coming is what we want to remind ourselves of as we go through this year. That we, as we unveil the person of Jesus Christ, we begin to see the second coming of Jesus Christ. I like our world and I like the fact that God is in everything. All things were created for him and by him. I like that because I'm going to end with a, 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 something that I myself was surprised when I found out in preparing this. When you see newspaper headlines, those catchy newspaper headlines, especially the boldly printed headlines, did you know that the font size for those boldly printed headlines is called second coming? In fact, it's something you can check. Just write second coming font for printing. It's called second coming. Those heavy black letters are reserved for only the most amazing front page news story. This dramatic type has been used to announce the beginning and end of wars, moon landings, presidential election winners, natural disasters, and other significant events on newspaper headlines. So when you see it, it is tagged, the font size for that announcement is second coming. I believe that one day, that font size will be a reality because it would announce the second coming of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It will be the headline news that will change all that humanity has suffered. That as humanity has used the second coming font size to tell great events, the second coming reality will bring a greater event. And that greater event 
is for all who know Jesus Christ, all who are prepared for his indeed real and literal second coming. It's no more going to be headline news. It's going to be a reality. I ask you the question as I sit down this morning. Are you ready for that headline event when Jesus will come? Let's bow our heads as we pray. Faithful God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. It has gone out. This same word has told us it will never return to you void. It will accomplish what it has been sent out for. Now, spirit of the living God, you who touch and change and transforms the hearts of men, eternal God, do it now. Do it now. Let your word touch our hearts. Change us. Give us hope. Give us confidence. And for some who don't know Jesus Christ, may their eyes be opened by the reality of your word. That one day, a headline will read, Jesus has come. Not written, but a reality. That as men have used the font for the second coming to announce major events, that reality is coming one day. Spirit of the living God, move in the hearts of your people to the glory and honor of your name. That we are testimonies of change and transformation and greater commitment because of your powerful work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.